Welcome everyone to another interview. I am joined today by the Dean of the Dialectic, the Titan of the Twitter threads, David W. Congdon. David, welcome along. Hi, thank you. That's all right. Uh, David, for those who don't know, is the author of The God Who Saves, a dogmatic sketch, and also The Mission of Demythologizing, uh, which is a big book on uh, Rudolf Hortman. <laughs> Here it comes. There it is. There it is. There it is. That it is, but uh, that it is as big as I mentioned, and then also, uh, yeah. yes, <laughs> um, <laughs> and another companion to Rudolf Bultmann as well. So uh, here, uh, for those of you who have heard it before or seen it before, I interviewed David uh, about eleven months ago or so, ten months ago, and uh, the God who saves is almost a year old. So we're going to kind of do a bit of a retrospective. But I thought before we before we get to the how it is now. For those who have never heard about this book before, who've never heard about you before, we should uh, wind the clock back a year, potentially. Uh, and uh, The God Who Saves has just come out. Uh, for those new to the game, talk to us about the book. Uh, where did it come from and, and what are you trying to sketch out? Right, yeah, thanks. Um, well, the book originated about 10 years ago. I was attempting to uh, think through what I believed about salvation and universalism. Um, uh, at the time, I was uh, a convinced universalist in the kind of more traditional Lombardian sense. Um, uh, Christ redeems all. Everyone's gonna, going to be re reconciled to God. Um, and I was asked to write a book that would elaborate on this view systematically. So explain how this position affects your doctrine of God, affects your doctrine of humanity, your creation, all the rest. Um, I had to shelve it. I, went, I did with the, that big book you just saw, um, and my theology started to change a bit. Came back to the project after I finished my, that big book, and um, I, this was the one I had been on my mind for a long time. And so uh, my, this problem was, for me, I had gotten uh, less, uh, I was less enamored by universalism um, in the traditional sense, and um, I still believed in this universal reconciliation of some kind. But um, my theology, I had to get a different. I had to find a different path to that position. Um, so the God who saves that is the version that is published um, is an attempt to not only uh, sketch out an alternative version of universalism, which it is, but it's much more important than that. It's an attempt to rethink theology from the ground up in a way that makes sense for me of a number of, of realities. For instance, um, the need to take, take into full consideration the kind of historical nature of our existence. And the fact that um, we, I, I wanted to get rid of talking about kind of abstract universals like all humanity or uh, God in the abstract. I wanted to really make theology concrete and connected to the actual experience of our life in this world. Um, so connecting God and salvation to our own actual experiences of, of abandonment and crisis and, and, um, uh, issues of our own identity and and uh, what it means to be a human person. So, um, the rethinking salvation in completely different ways uh, was what I ended up having to do in the mm -hmm. book. And uh, and then I used that and I flushed that out systematically. So, what it ends up becoming, um, what it ends up doing, serving is sort of a mini systematics that um, takes some of these existential historical realities of our life seriously as the starting point for how we think about God. Mm, great. Thank you. And uh, it's really good. Uh, so one of the things that, and you kind of touched on it, that struck me when I was actually reading the book is that it's not like, you know, a classic apologetics for universalism, uh, you know, in maybe what the sense that you may originally were setting out to do. Um, the book is concerned with something bigger, uh, as you've just illuminated. Uh, one thing I'd like to draw out is how you develop kind of a, a thoroughly missional picture of soteriology um, mm -hmm. that, you know, that then branches out into ecclesiology and eschatology. Uh, can you talk to us about this, uh, what I'm saying, like a missional nature of soteriology linked as you do to Jesus' death in God abandonment? 
Yeah, right. So mission um, is important for our project. I mean, my first book was called The Mission of Demythologizing. So mission is crucial for me in the sense of uh, this issue of cross-cultural, intercultural communication and, and uh, the change in which theology undergoes as it moves across culture and across history. Um, how is it that we are, uh, in some sense, united with Christians, uh, you know, in first century uh, or, you know, in 12th century Ethiopia or whatever, you know, they're all around the world. There's just a massive diversity. Um, what's the thread that connects us? What binds us together? Um, and so mission for me helps to articulate that. And so what I want to do in, in this God to Saves book is provide a theology that is inherently structurally missional in, in the sense that it takes this translation, intercultural, cross-cultural movement, um, and actually grounds it systematically. So, it, so historic, traditionally, you often locate mission and translation as a kind of practical thing you do at the end. You have all of your content all already built up, and then you tack on this translation bit at the end um, to explain, oh, how, how do we communicate this content that's already fixed and firm and stable to somebody else over there? And I, I wanted to say, we, we need to integrate the translation part into the actual content itself. We actually need a translatable content. That's the issue. Um, and so the guy who saves is an attempt to articulate a theology that um, is translatable in its essence, um, not simply in its practical outworking. Um, and so the, part of the way I do that is uh, I, I talk a lot about intercultural uh, theology, uh, which is something that's been important to my work. Um, and the issue of hybridity, uh, you know, theology is a hybrid construction where we, um, it's not sort of pure, stable content that then gets shifted around, but actually it's inherently impure, it's inherently contaminated uh, by, by culture all the time. Um, and part of the task um, of theology is um, not to try to find some sort of culture-free theology that's somehow um, you know, ahistorical and permanent. That doesn't exist. But what, what we have is constantly permeated, hybrid, contaminated uh, uh, forms of speaking and thinking about God and our task is, is to help um, kind of articulate that, but then to help shift it and move it in new directions um, in light of new situations. Uh, we've inherited something from one situation, and, our, and we are now uh, entrusted with the task of passing it on in a new, new form, in a new way. Um, so tradition for me becomes this task of, of translation uh, and this movement from one situation to the next. And so a theology that does that for me is, is one that embraces that movement um, at its heart and, uh, and makes it possible to do that kind of work. Mm, thank you. Yeah. So you, you touched on mission that God is saves and, and yes, here in my, in my two hands, cause that's what is required uh, is, you know, mission again. So you already kind of mentioned like why mission is so important to your work. I'm wondering, was there like autobiographically, was there a point where you realized the importance of, of mission? Because I know it's, it's in these books. It was also a big part of your editorial work uh, with the missiological engagement mm. series. Like, yeah, was there a point where yep. you were like, this is what needs to be addressed, either in your educational or autobiographical kind of past? Yes, I mean, there is. I mean, autobiographically, I, I am from a family of missionaries and pastors. So, I mean, I have um, missionaries in my extended family around the world. So that, that's part of it. I mean, I... Um, I would think about mission differently than they do, probably, <laughs> but nevertheless, that is autobiographically a part of my own upbringing. Um, for me, uh, a couple things are important. One, when I, I went to Wheaton College um, as an undergrad, and at Wheaton, I, um, I had a professor of anthropology, uh, Brian Howell, who uh, as, as I took this, his course as a prerequisite. You know, I had to take it. Um, but in that course, I was exposed to Andrew Walls for the first time. Uh, Andrew Walls is sort of the, you know, kind of grandfather of kind of contemporary missiology. Uh, his work is, is incredibly important for a lot of people. Um, but and, and in, in his book that we read, The, the Missionary Movement in Christian History, uh, he has this idea of translation, that um, God is inherently a God who is in translation, uh, you know, mm -hmm. from eternity to time you know, and, and across culture. 
So he makes translation uh, systematically structural to theology. He, he's, not, he's not a systematician. He doesn't flush it out himself, but he at least articulates that essential point. Um, now, uh, his work is, is uh, at an early stage of this development, so it has a lot of, you know, it's not as refined and nuanced as, you know, as later, later theorists would, would change it into. Mm -hmm. But, um, but it was crucial for me as a, somebody, as an undergrad student who had no exposure to this kind of idea, um, he, reading him was, was life altering uh, at, at that point in my life. So I wasn't in theology, but later um, when I did go into theology at seminary, uh, Walls', Walls his work came with me and it, it took on a new significance for me. So I went to Princeton Seminary, I had Daryl Guter as my professor. Um, Guter ended up serving on my committee for my dissertation precisely for this reason. But it was because uh, I found in him and also in John Flett, who was uh, in the program at the time, um, and who I took courses from actually uh, in my program, um, their work in, in conjunction um, brought the stuff I had read as an undergrad from Walls alive, made it uh, theologically fruitful um, and significant for me. Um, all of that was going on. There's one other significant point and that is um so i was reading all the stuff in mission and it was great i enjoyed it but i didn't connect it bolt one or to my own thinking in a sort of structural way for myself until um i was in the library archives there at princeton seminary um i was deep in the stacks deep well actually i was deep in the um the microfilm uh, in the basement <laughs> and i was looking through um old issues of this German journal uh, from 1930s. And I came across an article, uh, I, well, I came across a series of articles, uh, this debate that Boltmann had uh, with the German theologians at the time um, in 1932, 1933, over what's called the Aryan paragraph, which is this paragraph that the Nazis put into place to uh, bar um, Jewish uh, service, uh, uh, Jewish uh, employment uh, in, the, in the civil service. And Boltmann was, was uh, vehemently opposed to this. And in the debate, the German defenders of the Aryan paragraph say, they, they appeal to the issue of mission. They say, because there's an issue of, of culture, right? Um, because part of the issue here is, uh, Boltmann wants to say, isn't uh, it, that the New Testament gives us a basis for, for including all people, all cultural groups, and all, all ethnicities, mm. everybody's included in this, in this uh, reality. And no one's, no one's excluded. You know, the only criterion for being a, a, to work in the church is the spirit's presence, you know, baptism in the spirit, right? Um, so th this is an issue here about who can serve as pastor um, in the church. And, um, uh, and so the German defenders of the Aaron paragraph say that was only applicable in the, in the situation of a missionary church, which was the early Christian church. Once post that period, that church became a, a Volkskirche, a, a church of the people, a cultural church, uh, the established church. So they have a strict separation. The mission church only applies to that kind of first couple of generations. And then it, then it becomes an established community. And then, then, you can dispense with that, and then we can have ethnic uh, rules that demarcate who can be in, who can be in, who's out. And Boltmann has this line that says that the church is always a missionary church. Um, and he, and he, he makes this point emphatically. And this comes up a couple of places. But, but when I read that, it, it just kind of stood out. I mean, it kind of blew me away. I mean, I just saw it there on the page, and I wasn't expecting to find it there. I didn't know it was even in his writings. Um, and when I read that, I realized, you know, it all made sense. Like, now I can see the, his entire work makes sense now in light of mission. Um, and then that kind of, for me, was this moment of, of epiphany. I realized um, uh, I can do the same thing in my own theology. I need to make this central to how I think about everything, methodology, all the way to eschatology, right? Mm -hmm. It's all there. So, yeah. Yeah, great. A, uh, a good endorsement to, you know, spend time in libraries. Uh, it is. Yeah. Um, so a final question about the book before talking about the book in another temporal moment. Uh, I'm wondering what your employment of, of concepts such as the co-crucifixion uh, and your talk of salvation as a participatory occurrence. 
Um, and like, I was really attracted to those in the book and I'm wondering how you feel they relate or don't relate to ideas of kind of theosis, uh, or Christification, you know, that is in other people's works and uh, around the way. Um, cause it's particularly the idea that those who have been rejected by the world, like they're the ones who have already kind of been Christified or, or had a, you know, theosis kind of experience as the job of conscious Christians to seek kind of revelation and salvation in their midst. So I was just wondering about your thoughts on those kind of connections or uh, divergences. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting you mentioned that because, um, so I get the co-crucifixion part actually from Michael Gorman's work. Hmm. Um, now <laughs> Gorman, as you may know, um, uh, well, so he wrote a very good book on, on, uh, was it becoming, um, becoming the gospel. Yeah, well, that that's a new one. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm forgetting the title. I oh. I referred to it in the book, but uh, you know, he he wrote a book earlier on on uh, theosis, hmm. uh, theosis and uh, and co-crucifixion, which so I um I wrote a review of it actually and criticized him on the theosis part, which then he refers to and uses as the basis for his new book on becoming the gospel. So in the in the preface of that book, he refers to me and talks about how uh, my criticism of him on theosis and mission. Uh, led him to write the <laughs> the book in response. Um, so what, what's interesting about that is this: um, I am a critic of the theosis talk, um, but uh, you know the way somebody like Gorman wants to use it, you know, I I can I can appreciate what he's trying to do. The issue I have with it is um, theosis uh, metaphysically, you know, philosophically, uh, it depends on a certain account of essence and accident. Mm. That there's a uh, there's a um, there's a divine essence that, um, that we become ontologically connected to, uh, conform to, participate, participate in. Um, and I, I have, so there's a whole metaphysics that's implied in the concept of theosis that I think we should jettison. <laughs> we, at least we shouldn't take on board. And when, when I challenge people like Gorman and other people about this, they're quick to say, well, you know, I'm just using it in this more constrained sense of participation. You know, that, that's all it means. And that point, I, I want to say, let's just talk about participation. You know, mm -hmm. theosis is a, is a loaded concept historically that uh, within Eastern Orthodox uh, theology has a very clear um, platonic metaphysical framework that you really have to have in place to make sense of the concept itself historically. So, um, so I, if I get rid of the metaphysics, I think I have to get rid of theosis as a term. So it doesn't have any purchase for me in that sense. But the idea, the idea of participation, I think, is very important. Um, my my way of doing this, though, is to say um, uh, to avoid kind of this ontological participation, to avoid that kind of talk about it. Um, although we can talk about maybe ways that we can rethink about ontology, but um, but to say, so it's not about we, we don't share in some attributes of God or we don't share in some, some essence that is, uh, you know, eternal that we kind of share into. There's no mystical, magical properties we, we, we participate in. Um, participation is about conformity, conformity of action, in my, uh, or in my case, conformity of existence, actually. So I, I ex existentialize the talk of participation mm -hmm. Um, so I take it out of the realm of ontology and put it in the realm of existence and historicity and, and action. Um, our lived existence uh, becomes uh, conformed to Christ. Doesn't, there's no um, sort of, I, I, I try to get rid of um, nature talk, get rid of nature. We don't, there's no metaphysical nature that we share in, right? Um, so in that sense, I'm, I'm non-sacramental in that regard or I'm non-ontological in that sense. Um, but rather, uh, there's a shared repetition of Christ. So we participate in Christ as we repeat him mm -hmm. in our lived existence. So um, my use of repetition here is from Kierkegaard and, and others in the tradition who um, try to get away from the essence, metaphysics talk of that, of that Western tradition and move more towards an existential historical way of thinking about mm -hmm. um, how, do, how does one, one event relate to a prior event. Mm. So in this sense, the normative event is Jesus and his death and, and God abandonment. And the, the, rep, the repeated events are our particular moments of repetition where our lived existence repeats and therefore participates in um, 
the the death, the singular death of Jesus. Um, so part so part of what I do in my work is to try to try to expand the category of repetition. Think about repetition as a way of non-identical repetition. So it's it's there's a um, and there's been a lot of talk about this in the literature more recently, but um, there's versions of non-identical repetition that I don't like. The radical orthodoxy stuff is one version that I try to avoid. Um, but there's other accounts that I, I would I could take on board. Um, anyway, all I have to say is um, uh, I I do want to think about co-crucifixion as a as a participatory reality, but I want to get away from a lot of mm. ontological and metaphysical baggage that comes along with that category and rethink it in terms of our historical existence in our concrete life. Yeah, I like that a lot uh, going through it. And like I had read your book kind of at the kind of over the end to the beginning of last year and then this year for my studies and my thesis I've been reading a lot of James Cone and I, I kept finding a lot of parallels there with you know kind of almost like Cone's idea of, getting, of becoming black as the like seeking out yeah. Christ and finding that which is a not an abstract thing it's about an actual yeah on the ground canonic right. move to it's, the margins yeah yeah it's solidarity right it's yeah. it's a participation in terms of, of emancipatory solidarity uh, you know so yes yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, 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 there's a lot of that in the background of my thought when mm. I'm writing that stuff. That's yeah. cool. Uh, so, okay, moving to the present, uh, the God who still saves. Uh, so it's one year old. Um, starting in general, how have you found the book's reception? And uh, what, if anything, has surprised you? Well, I mean, I can't really go too long here without talking about the obvious uh, surprise, and that is it cost me my job. Um, so, uh, I mean, it was, um, you know, so when you interviewed me last, um, that was, you know, so like a month later, you know, I, I was, I lost my job as a result of the book. Um, so, you know, I would say this past year has been um, the most difficult in my life. Uh, I, I would, I, I could say that with some confidence. Um, and... You know the the themes of the book are are all about you know sharing in the in the suffering of Christ, kind of this movement into the position of God abandonment, right? This, this crisis, this existential crisis. Um, and I think the book has become much more relevant to me than I ever expected it to be. Um, I mean, it's it's become uh, more true. Um, the words have more meaning for me now than they did when I first wrote them. Um, and and so in that sense um i've kind of i've learned from myself i guess Mm. um i think you know i uh uh, it's just you know it's been a very tough road um there's been a lot of 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 encouragement along the way i mean i've been very encouraged and and frankly surprised by uh, the amount of outpouring of support i've received um uh, about the book I, you know, many people uh, wrote very kind things to me about it that I, I just, you know, was very grateful for and, and uh, meant a lot to me. Um, you know, I, I think for me, theology, uh, theology really needs to have, it needs to be pastoral and, and it needs to preach and it needs to be pastoral. Um, if it doesn't, if it doesn't do those things, it's, it's not really worth doing. Um, and, and I, I wrote the book for people like myself who were, um, well, I, I guess we would say uh, post-evangelical, maybe even post-Christian uh, believers, uh, people who were, who, people who have lost faith in the traditional uh, ideas and practices and structures of Christian, Christian mm-hmm. faith. Um, and, and yet um, desperately held on to a relationship of some kind, an encounter with the divine that, um, that was life-giving for them um, and meaningful. And what I wanted to do in this book was really to articulate what that means, what kind of life-giving encounter with God is there, um, and how do we understand that theologically in a way that doesn't just simply jettison the text and jettison tradition. For, like, for, for me, I, I sympathize deeply with those, you know, um, who who want to get rid of the religion and keep the spirituality and and um, and I think there's a lot of um, 
well-meaning truth there. Um, what I wanted to do was actually show how you could arrive at their, those kinds of positions through the text, through the tradition. Um, you don't have to get rid of the Bible to, uh, to arrive at a, you could call it a postmodern faith or to, to arrive at a, uh, you know, con a, a very deconstructive or, um, you know, radical form of Christian, uh, Christian identity. Um, I, I do believe very strongly you can get that from the text itself and, and that it's, it's there waiting to be, uh, to be received and interpreted. Um, and so I, I, I wrote the book for those seekers, you know, those wanderers, um, those exiles from, from the Christian tradition who had been marginalized, uh, oppressed and abused by the church, um, by religion in general, perhaps, and yet uh, were desperately in pursuit of some kind of meaning and, and connection um, that would take them out, out of themselves, uh, beyond themselves. So, um, so I, you can, I use traditional exegesis and, and Christian tradition and theology in there, but um, you know, at, the, at the end of the day, what I'm trying to articulate is an experience that is uh, beyond religion. It doesn't, it's, um, it's beyond Christianity. It's a, in that sense, the God who saves is in some sense uh, an attempt at a post-Christian theology. Um, it's a paradox, but it's also the truth. I mean, I think, um, God is no more bound to Christianity than, than to any other uh, system of belief. And um, I think the sooner that Christian theologians grapple with that reality and you know, articulate it in their, in their theology, the better. Um, and, and this was an, uh, an attempt to do that, that very thing. Um, and I, so um, all that to say is I, I, I find myself in a position now where um, I am in even deeper sympathy with the people who I was writing for than I was when I wrote it. Um, I, I, myself today, I, you know, um, you know, I, 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 the alienation I've experienced from the church and from, from evangelicals and from Christians, you know, it's, it's been tough. Um, but at the same time, I found a new community of people uh, who, who themselves feel out of place within the church um, and who don't, um, who don't know where they belong. And part of the effort of this book was to say, um, uh, you already belong. Um, you, you are already uh, with God and God is with you. Um, and uh, part of the task of this book was to help articulate um, what that looks like and why. I mean, and, and I'm also writing for Christians who are part of the traditional church structures to say, if you want to demonstrate your fidelity to Jesus Christ, you need to abandon the, the assumption that your church structures and traditions have um, the exclusive grasp of the truth, and you need to ally yourselves with those who have been marginalized by the church. That, that and only that way will, will you uh, conform to Christ and be, uh, live into the faith that you're called to live into. Um, so in that sense, it's a, it's, a, it's a call to Christians to... Um, to to put their Christianity at risk. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think it, it succeeds in all that and is a, a deeply pastoral book. And I'm sure there are many others, I mean, as you've indicated, who have experienced a kind of a, an isolating from the tradition they grew up in, a, uh, uh, experienced pain from the tradition they grew up in, uh, you know, whether they've been people who've been employed within the church or just, you know, kids who went along and teenagers who went along kind of thing. Um, yeah. And I, I think The God Who Saves is a, is a, an accessible book and and has uh capacity to reach a wide range of audiences but i'm sure there are many also who have experienced this kind of isolation or experienced this kind of i don't get how what i feel now can match up with what i was told who maybe haven't kind of ever approached a theological text do you have any ideas of how or any um uh, vision to kind of i, I guess have a more a pop uh, pop theology yeah. version of the God who saves uh, for for those I've, who, yeah. I've already started it. Um, oh, actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know when it will be finished or when I would actually uh, hope to get that out. But no, I, I that's been on my mind actually significantly since I wrote it. Um, it became apparent to me almost immediately that that was the book I needed to write next or mm -hmm. soon. Um, yeah, I mean, it's so, yes, I am, I am working on it. I, I think in the meantime, you know, there are, um, 
I, I think there are lots of really good resources out there. Um, I, I, it's uh, maybe I don't have t off the top of my head. I can't give you a list right at this mm -hmm. point, but I could I could probably refer people to some things. Um, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I do feel a lot of, of of kinship with somebody like Peter Rollins, you know, somebody like that. Who um, maybe I don't share everything that he does, but a, a good bit of it, our work overlaps in a lot of ways. Um, I think, but so there's definitely stuff out there that that I would I could point people to, um, but I do hope to write a, a pop version <laughs> of this of this book. Um, yeah. it, it's important to me. I mean, I think part of I, the book, you know, the um, the hybrid nature of the God who saves is is a, a manifestation of the fact that there were just multiple competing streams. Um, that I was trying to reconcile. I mean, I was um, being asked to deal with this universalism discussion that I had from you know a decade ago. That mm -hmm. that was the initiating point of the book contract yeah. uh, to all um, all my Boltmann research, which I was trying to synthesize and make constructive. And then, mm -hmm. but all this other new stuff that I was coming across, and more of the kind of the post-Christian dimension that I wanted to really deal with, um, and, and much, many other things as well. Mm -hmm. And so, you know. Um, so the book, in some sense, um, it kind of, it's trying to both speak to the scholars and say, um, uh, there is an argument to the scholars to say, your analysis of these texts and your analysis of these theologians is inadequate. Mm -hmm. And you need to take into, into account, um, there's a, a broader range of, of material to, to engage with. Um, but there's also, I mean, alongside all that stuff, there's, there's my own message to people like myself or others who um, are hurting or have been uh, marginalized and, and to say, um, here's an account of a God uh, of, of Christian faith that um, I, I hope speaks to you and, and um, uh, affirms where you are and, mm. and, con and connects the experience of God to your actual reality. Um, so I, uh, I wish it were easier to kind of, parses apart um the, the monograph version and the, mm -hmm. the pop version but um it is what it is so uh, hopefully yeah. both sides can read it and profit from it uh, here i was thinking it was as easy as just opening up microsoft word thesaurus and looking for different words for all the the, the jargon but i guess not oh, man um <laughs> so well i guess you know you're talking about like other accessible things that are already out there you've kind of i guess in this last year turned more to you know to twitter as a way to uh, explore different ideas um, to in maybe some ways process the uh, community or the tradition that you've you've come out of um, to you know ex explain things to those who, who don't understand you did a you know and you've done uh, the kind of Twitter seminary uh, is a thing of hashtag Twitter seminary which people can check out as well as just different threads on things that have been important like uh, evangel 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 evangelicalism's wedding to power or uh, a lot of the NT right Gnosticism and transgenderism discussion, yeah. uh, you know, uh, race and power, like a lot of different things. How have you found that both as a, I guess, a teaching tool and, and, and the reception of it, and also even just in your own, as something for yourself to be able to uh, share thoughts in a free and uh, kind of more immediate way? Yeah. I mean, for a long time, I had a blog. Um, and that was my, my way to, uh, kind of test out ideas, I guess. Um, and that blog was, was very uh, important for me. I mean, that was how the God of Saved originated actually. You know, I, I did a blog series on universalism. That's how all that started. Um, and, you know, being a part of kind of the blogosphere for, you know, in theology, um, gave me a sense of the need to speak outside of the academic guild um i w when i was doing the blogging more regularly i would i would repeatedly get uh comments and emails you know um with an appreciation but also for clarification and follow-up and there's just a lot of people out there who are interested in these topics um don't have the money for an academic book and don't can't go to school can't you know they're not going to read these massive tomes and that's and, and why should they you <laughs> know um and so uh, the blogs had a real service that I was um, I was proud to, to be able to offer and, and help people think through some of these ideas. Um, but it became impossible for me to maintain the blog, um, particularly um, when I 
uh, was well, I was when I was in my PhD program, it became increasingly less and less of a a, a place for me to do any actual writing. Um, and and when I took my the job, um, uh, my first job as an editor, um, I had to basically shut it down um, for multiple reasons. But um, so that was that was uh, well. So I took the job actually right as I was beginning to write my dissertation. Mm-hmm. So I had the full time job. I was trying to write a massive book on Boltmond, <laughs> which turned out to a you know almost a thousand page book, um, and I just had no time for anything else. Uh, and so the blog just, just had to languish and I, I basically put it into a kind of retirement at that point. Well, in place of that, um, social media was developing alongside of this and I joined Twitter, you know, fairly early on, but, um, I, I didn't really know what to use it for until I began to see academics get on there and really mobilize it for advocacy and mm-hmm. actual discussion, real discussion. When, uh, and so I remember the first time I saw like a thread, <laughs> the first time I actually saw a real thread on Twitter, it was kind of a, a eye opener to me. I, wow, you know, this, this, this changes the game now for me. I don't have to just try to fit everything into a single tweet and that's <laughs> called a day. Um, now maybe I took it too far, <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, <laughs> You know, what I like about Twitter is, uh, so the thing with the blog is that it's close enough to an actual published essay or a published article or, you know, whatever, that you feel compelled to, as an academic myself, as a perfectionist academic myself, you feel compelled to adhere to a certain stylistic guidelines and norms. You know, you've got to, you got to footnote that stuff, right? <laughs> you got to put the put those yeah. notes in there. You've got to document properly. You've got to put the nice paragraphs, the good form, structure, all that stuff. That's even probably more so for an editor, right? You you know you got to right. practice what yeah, you got to be telling everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely, so I, it became exhausting, right? You know, I I I was put I was putting in so much labor into these blog posts. Well, Twitter comes along and just it says you you don't doesn't matter anymore. You don't care. You know, just put it into <laughs> 140 characters. You can use whatever grammar you want or no grammar at all. Um, that's all. That's all fine. So all of a sudden, I was liberated from this perfectionistic <laughs> impulse, which has always kind of hampered me. Um, and, and I could just just give the ideas, just, mm-hmm. just sheer content. I didn't have to. I didn't have to find ways to buffer it with nice transition sentences. You know, <laughs> I didn't have to worry about paragraph structure. I just had to get the theses out there. And the thing about it is, like for me. Um, I, I came into theology, um, reading people like Eberhard Jungle and Jungle especially is the master of the thesis. So he loves these, he has whole, whole essays that are just thesis statements and hmm. um, they're organized nicely, but they're just thesis statements. Um, this is a very German mode of, of academic writing. Um, and at seminary under Bruce McCormick, um, McCormick would very often uh, ask us to write thesis statement papers, where we would also do the same thing. We'd write a thesis statement and a paragraph elaborating on it. It's a thesis statement, right? Mm-hmm. So I got very, very good at just writing entire essays of just theses. Mm-hmm. Um, lo and behold, this is excellent practice for, tw- for tweeting <laughs> because um, that's all it is, right? Mm-hmm. It's just a bunch of tweets, basically. Um, so, you know, I, uh, w- going into the mode of Twitter, uh, and these long Twitter threads I wanted to put together, these Twitter seminary mm-hmm. threads, um, they're just basically my thesis essays, these, these theses, uh, and then just individualized into a, into a tweet. Uh, and maybe, you know, with some formatting and some emojis and maybe something, whatever. You know, some, a a gift or two. Yeah. <laughs> um, right, exactly, definitely. Um, and, that, and that was great. So it just felt very natural to me, and uh, it really relieved me a lot of the stress about mm-hmm. trying to create that kind of content. Um, and you didn't have to worry about trying to defend every point in the academically pure peer review style, right? Um, I wrote like peer review quality blog posts. <laughs> and, you know, I, and I, I it was a lot of pressure. Now I could yeah. dispense with all that. Um, and so I loved it, you know, it was great. And I, I still love it, although um, it's been harder now uh, having to move and everything else with this new job I've got um, to try to maintain the, the Twitter seminary. I did the Twitter seminary 
while I was unemployed. <laughs> so, um, that was a period of my life where I didn't have a job yeah. um, and uh, it was a little easier to, to crank those out. Mm. Um, but now I do have a job and I'm still trying to write these books I'm nice. overdue for. <laughs> so I, 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 I do plan to get back to it, but cool. yeah. I don't know if anyone's ever set up a Patreon page for Twitter threads yet, but uh, maybe you can <laughs> find some way to, to get that happening. Like podcasts, they've, they've you know, monopolized the Patreon. Yeah. Thing. Maybe you can spread right. its wigs. I also think I need to send I mean, this. I, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I've been asked to do a Patreon. Um, you know, it came up one time. I, I just, I know I don't have the time to produce yeah. enough content to warrant people to support me. Uh, yeah. But I would love to. I mean, that would be great. I mean, I'd love to be able to just write and freelance. Um, mm. my scholarship I think uh, someday that would be an ideal situation but uh, not quite there yet okay, yeah that's great I, um, I also think I'll, I'll contact Princeton after this because I think we got a great pull quote for their uh, new courses like you know sets you up perfectly for Twitter you know that's Princeton Theological <laughs> Seminary you know come there out you of here you're ready yeah. for ministry and Twitter whatever you know whatever you need um, <laughs> that's great um, so we spoke as a we spoke last year, and obviously since then a lot of uh, personal change has occurred. But we also spoke. I think it was about like two weeks, maybe before the the presidential elections, um, mm -hmm. and we were talking then about the disturbing nature of the the um, of evangelical institutions or, or leaders um, and and their behaviour, you know, around that election and their endorsement of Trump and and so forth. Now it was. I don't know how, what we could have predicted, like in terms of the year after Trump's election, like, I don't know if it's gone worse as expected. I don't know. Like it was so hard to predict that I'm looking from the outside. So I'm not the right person to be right. saying how it's gone. Um, but certainly one of the trumbling trends has continued is the, uh, still the ongoing evangelical support uh, is the, the fact that, for quite a while after the president's refusal to condemn the Charlottesville rally, no one from the evangelical board, uh, advisory board left. I mean, I know uh, in the end that happened, but uh, that took some time. Um, there was the, you know, uh, at the Southern Baptist conference, the uh, initial uh, refusal to uh, condemn white supremacy, which then the next day got changed. So, it's been a big year in that, in this respect. Um, uh, you have, there's more things than you can even like begin to comprehend it. And a thing that feels like a year ago was actually three weeks. Um, Cause things are always happening. And I know you've sort of addressed on the Twitter seminary and, and just on Twitter, this, this, you know, the faith and power and, and the church and, and protection kind of thing. I don't know what the question is really, but I'm thinking about the book and this, this, call to be co-crucified and the call to, you know, cross boundaries and, and stand in solidarity and participate with those who the world has already rejected. Um, how have you felt, you know, yeah, looking at this year as it's gone and, and, you know, having such an experience of, with the Christian tradition in America and, and having this book, which is, you know, a consistent call to be crucified rather than be glorified. Uh, yeah, what, what have been your thoughts as you've watched this, if you've been able to develop any kind of systemized thought on it at all? Uh, well, it's painful. I mean, it's a daily, uh, I mean, I don't, I, 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 it's hard to, to kind of synthesize all my thoughts I have on this because it's so visceral, right? Mm. Um, I mean, as somebody who grew up, you know, deeply embedded with an evangelicalism, um, uh it's uh yeah okay so maybe i'll what to say about this i one of the things i guess what part of what i've come to grips with are two things um one is that um there there is a positive tradition within evangelicalism um and that that's been uh it's been very real for me because i'm descended from that positive tradition. I mean, the Jonathan Blanchard is my ancestor. He's the founder of Wheaton and I, I'm a you know, sixth generation from him. And Blanchard, you know, if you, Blanchard was a, was a radical abolitionist at the time, you know, and um, I mean, if anybody would have been out there, you know, with, you know, 
the anti-fascists and the you know the new abolitionists you know groups and Black Lives Matter. I mean, Blanchard would have been in the front of all that. I mean, he would have been in the you know, he would have been getting arrested repeatedly. He would have been fighting, and he was just a, he he just thrived on shaking up the social order. Um, that's what he did, and. Um, there is this deep legacy within evangelicalism to do that. And I think, so part of what I, even though I, I no longer identify with it as an evangelical, I, I, there, what I love about evangelicalism historically is, evangelicalism is historically a renewal movement. It is a movement that um, is, recognizes that the, 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 the Christian order has become part of the powers and principalities. And that's and historically what what it's done is to shake that up um, and to move it in a more progressive, liberating dimension. So this happened with the Pietists over against the Lutheran Orthodoxy um, over in Europe. It migrated over with the Awakenings, and, and it was a uh, evangelicalism was the the, the the challenge to the power structures of the kind of mainline denominations of the early colonial era um, and uh, into the 19th century. And so. You know, the evangelicals were, were, were the ones who would challenge orthodoxy. They would challenge uh, in unjust social structures, all that stuff. Um, now, uh, what happened is that uh, the renewal movement dimension of evangelicalism is also uh, its Achilles heel. Um, it has a tendency to, uh, to fracture very quickly um, and to mobilize around uh, particular um, cultural identifying markers. It doesn't really have uh, a tradition. It doesn't have uh, a creed. It doesn't have anything to stabilize itself. All it has is this renewal movement going on. Mm. Now, part of that I, I want to reclaim, and, and, and I'll get back to that in a second, but um, there's this gap. This is a vacuum in the middle of evangelicalism. It doesn't have a thing. It doesn't have a substance to it. It's just this challenging of the prevailing order. Um, so it's kind of, it's anarchic in a certain regard, um, reg regarding the church. Um, and that's a great thing when it's leveraged, you know, towards, you know, addressing issues of injustice. It's a very bad thing though, uh, when it comes to trying to um, establish itself because it doesn't actually have anything to provide any sort of positive norm. All it has, what it fills that void with are authoritarian leaders who come in and provide the, the, the structure and grounding that it doesn't, doesn't have for itself. Um, or it fills it with other things like um, uh, just, just social organization. So for example, um, so there, it, there is no creed for evangelicalism, right? You, you, they basically, if there is one, it's just we believe in the Trinity, we believe in the Bible, you know? It's, 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 it's almost as simple as that. All even evangelicals in the 19th century also didn't believe in the Trinity necessarily. A lot of Unitarians came out of the evangelical movement. So, um, so it's really just a biblicist movement, right? It's just the Bible. Um, but the Bible, of course, is, as we all know, inherently uh, polyvalent and capable of being interpreted in an infinite number of ways, it seems. Um, so you can use the Bible as a weapon regard to in almost any way you want to. You can use it for to challenge the powers of principalities, or you can use it to support them. Um, and it was a very easy move for evangelicals to move from one to the other. Uh, all it took was a certain sort of satisfaction with the cultural situation. Um, and it required some leaders to come along and say, we're okay with the social situation. And you should, and to be evangelical means to follow me um, and to settle down and become part of our social order. Um, and this happened uh, post World War II. Um, with the establishment of Fuller and Christianity Today, um, a bunch of other evangelical institutions, the National Association of Evangelicals, you know, all these things formed at the same time. And um, evangelicalism as we know it today um, was born from this, basically it's like the move from the hippies to the boomers, right? You know, they, you know, they, they just settled down mm. and became part of, you know, the establishment. Um, and so, because there was nothing there to provide some sort of normative direction and grounding for the move for evangelicalism, it was it very quickly became co-opted by the state and co-opted by the, the the structures of power um, and the economy, capitalism, uh, and the rest. Um, mm -hmm. 
it became identifiable with with nationalism essentially uh, with american exceptionalism um so all of the the original sin of racism in this country um the the, in, the emphasis on free enterprise and the emphasis uh, you know all the rest on kind of individual liberty and individualism in general that that kind of makes up american democracy uh, if it is a democracy um that all those features um this kind of libertarian uh, ethos of American identity, um, just that became the creed for evangelicalism because it didn't have one in itself. It didn't have any sort of basis. So it just took on that, that ethos of American life. Um, and that's, and that's, that's unfortunately what, what, what we're at today. Uh, I mean, I think basically evangelicalism is inherently co-optable <laughs> um, by whatever authoritarian leadership comes into place that says, um, your faith and identity is at stake, uh, it is at risk unless you follow me, unless you do these things and, and conform in this way. Um, and because they don't have anything, there's, there, there's no Catholic social ethic tradition, for example, to challenge mm -hmm. that, right? Mm -hmm. It's just they're at the whims of whatever leadership uh, structure is in place. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so well, we are where we are. Mm -hmm. And I, it's, it's very sad. Um, part of what I see my, my kind of identity and vocation to be is to recover the prophetic evangelical tradition um, of the early 19th century, of my own family, um, I should say, um, um, and to and recover that over against evangelicalism. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I think the only way to be an authentic evangelical today is to reject evangelicalism. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I firmly believe that. Um, and so, um, uh, unfortunately, that that's. I mean, I think there's a situ situation. It, it's not. It's not dissimilar from uh, situations in the past in ancient Christian history, where you know, to be a Christian meant some way to challenge Christian. Um, you know, whether it was you know, uh, the imperial Christianity of the medieval era or whatever it might be. I mean, I think the Reformation is the same kind of situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the Reformation is in some ways. Uh, it's a genuinely evangelical movement in this regard. It's a. Uh, you know. Um, Christians rejecting the church uh, in order to reclaim a more authentic Christianity. Uh, I think today to do that um, re requires us. It, it, we are we are required to reject evangelicalism, um, and that and in doing so, we remain faithful to the genuine evangelical impulse. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for that. Um, one final question. So just last week there were a series of. of Excellent written reflections on the uh, DET digital magazine, which is a D evangelization theologian. I think I nailed that pronunciation. Um, what was it like to have your work with engaged in such a way? But, but really what I'm actually interested in is who wrote the best reflection? Um, just <laughs> straight name. Let's just no dealing around who was the best uh, in the thing. Uh. <laughs> no, Juan Torres and uh, David uh, Roberts, they were both wrote very nice. Uh, pieces about my book, and I'm very grateful to them both uh, for for agreeing to do that. I mm -hmm. mean, I I didn't know that they had agreed initially, and uh, I found out later um, that was really kind of them. Um, no, I I uh, it, it was it was great. I mean, I really enjoyed to hear their thoughts about my work um, and be able to be kind of uh, engaged in that in that way, and it gave me a good opportunity to kind of clarify some things. I've had a lot of conversations over the last year that have kind of uh, made it very clear to me um, the aspects of my book that are, are limiting or that I need to flesh out a little further. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot more I, I want to say, um, kind of to develop some of the ideas I put forward in that book, which, you know, I didn't have the space or the time to flesh out. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was very grateful to them. Uh, they've both been very good friends and, and close uh, supporters of my work. And I, I'm, I'm very happy about that. And yeah. it's, just, uh, it's gratifying to see something you've done um, be meaningful to other people. I mean, I think, um, I think every book, once you write it, it's no longer your own. It really mm -hmm. takes on a life of its own and, and people can make of it what they, what they need to make of it. Um, I, I think with um, Umberto Eco I had a great line, I think about the name of the rose where he said, um, uh, upon finishing a book, an author sh should properly die. Um, <laughs> so as not to trouble the path of the book. <laughs> You know, I think in some ways I feel that way about the guy to say the ideas there don't belong to me. I mean, I'm 
I mean, in many, in many respects, the ideas I'm taking from other people, I'm just kind of repackaging it and fleshing out in new ways. But, um, but I, I want the book and the ideas of the, in the book to, uh, to be a shared property. They belong to, to the church, to the wider world, and to those who are struggling to figure out what it means to speak of God in our time. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, if people can, uh, if, it, if it speaks to them and they can uh, make of it their own, um, that's, that's the best thing I can ask for as an author. That's great. I didn't want to coach you too much, but technically you also wrote a reflection for DET. So you could claim that your one was the best if you wanted. Um, uh, no, nah, no worries. <laughs> Here for my guests. Um, David, thank you very much. Uh, I truly did appreciate The God Who Saves. It was a very meaningful book for me. I'm sorry that it did not come without a cost, uh, but um, it is a, a, a excellent work that I hope only spreads and uh, it can spread by you guys, by buying a copy, by uh, reviewing on Amazon and doing all those good things. Um, But yes, uh, I appreciate your time twice, actually three times now since you were part of the inaugural Jesus 1224 conference. Uh, So yeah, I appreciate your time and uh, and your insights uh, today. Thank you, Liam. It's been a pleasure. No worries. Thank you. Uh,